Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here, looking still at chapter one of the Keys of Enoch. And in our last video, we looked at the first five verses out of uh, chapter one. We did a bit of an introduction, so you may consider checking out that video after you watch this one. But in this one, we're going to start down here in verse six. Now, what we're looking at is how that we live in a many and one universe. That's key number one. Key number two says the creative mind as the center of this universe is known as Lord, King or Redeemer. And then uh, key number three is the creations which survive are the creations which desire that the species gather life and light into the image and similitude of the higher evolution, which is the living universe. So those are the keys. And like we said, we're down here in, um, I think, what could be called the explanation of the keys or the expoundation of the keys, if that's even a word. Anyway, we're, we're going to start here in verse six and we're going to see how far we make it. Now, verse six, it explains why the order of these three keys were set this way. Um, it says that the scroll starts off with the opened ended cosmology rather than a closed ended cosmology. Well, let me just read it. It says, for if it were to say in the first key, the creative mind as the center of this universe is known as Lord, King and Redeemer, it would put all galaxies into a single universe. So you can imagine that if this were the first key, the first thing that we understood is that our father creator is at the center of our universe. Well, then we'll start to think that this is the only universe that is in existence. But then look at verse seven. It says, when man starting off with his own three dimensional concept of God would limit God to that universe. And this is exactly what we've done. We've limited our father to this universe, which is actually scary in light of the fact that we live in a multi universe, because you think about it, if he is the God of this universe only and we are start to think about other universes, should this God of this universe be concerned about the gods of the other universes or are there other gods on the other universes? So that's why it's important for him to order it in this way. Verse eight is talking about how then we would start arguing the meaning of God or the definition of what God is. And here it is. You see, we're doing that. This is actually going on. And I believe this is because we've always been taught that this is the only universe. Um, and so just what it says here is actually true. How we start to argue the meaning of God and what is God. Verse 9 goes on to define some of the other ways that we uh, try to put our father in a box. Like, for instance, the Christian theologians uh, would call him Civitas uh, Dei or the, the city of God. I believe that's talking about Rome over there. And then we see other ways that uh, we would put our father in a box if he uh, were the father of this universe alone. But then you see right there, it says... And I quote, or is God beyond the nature of description, whereby Yahweh means that no man should begin to define what is beyond definition. And so we hear this even have people saying that we're not supposed to pronounce the name of our creator at all or the name of our father. Hallowed be his name. And I used to believe that, too, back when I thought that the commandment that says not to take the Lord's name in vain was actually talking about speaking his name. And turns out we learned in the Shepherd of Hermas that that's not what it means at all. Uh, to, to take the Lord's name in vain is to say, for instance, to say that you are a Christian. However, you don't follow the rules of Christ. You, you put a big Jesus piece on your chest as if you are, are, are a disciple, yet you don't obey none of the uh, precepts in the Bible. That's what it means to take on his name in vain and when we start to understand that and think back on who it was that told us that we're not supposed to be speaking his name or not even supposed to know his name we kind of see where that all kind of comes from so we we have to understand that if it's written in the bible um we're, 
we obviously are supposed to know it. Um, it's just a matter of getting these four letters right. And we, we've talked about this in other classes. Uh, these four letters, you know, a lot of times you will hear people trying to pronounce this name and they will pronounce it with two syllables like in Yahweh or three syllables like in Yahweh. Um, this is actually a four syllable word. We can't have one H sound and then the other H is silent. That really doesn't make sense. So whatever his name is, however it is that we're supposed to pronounce this um, would be a four syllable word. But the reason why we are uh, struggling with this, I believe, is because, you know, we've put our father in a box. We've uh, limited him to this single universe. Verse 10 says, if you look beyond definition, what do you see? Universe beyond universe. You see the many and one, or as the Greek philosophers would say, the incon pan. So this explains why the book starts off this way with the very first key explaining to us that we live in a many and one universe. And it also lends to the understanding of why there are so many other uh, gods or Elohim talked about in the in the scripture. You have to remember that the first commandment in back there in Exodus chapter 20 uh, said that you will put no other God before me. Well, that lets us know that there are other gods. And what it is, is some of these gods are limited to this particular universe, whereas the most high God the ultimate creator, our father in heaven, hallowed be his name, is at the center of all of these universes. Now, I don't plan on hitting every one of these verses. Um, uh, a lot of this uh, book gets into um, the mathematics or the science behind a lot of this stuff. And I'm afraid many people, myself included, may not understand all of it. So I'm not going to try to bog myself down trying to explain it all. Um, we do put up the um, read alongs that if you wanted to get in depth into this you can actually go to the source yourself and read the scripture and if you do you know find some understanding in those higher minded verses if you will please share them with us in the comment section um it's great when you guys expound on some of these verses um it kind of helps the rest of us get an understanding in it um that's kind of why we're doing it like that but anyway let's look right here at verse 12 it says, by going into the splendor of the universes, you recognize a higher plan of creation that can be seen in this universe, in this level of creation. So when we expound our understanding that we live in a multi-universe, then, you know, we get a better understanding of this, this particular universe. Verse 13 says, then you can understand that one must go beyond all theologies and all cosmologies, which say that this is God here, only in this level of creation. Again, putting our father in a box, limiting him and who he is and what he's capable of. Dropping down to verse 16, it says he is beyond all universes and yet all universes function collectively as the brain diagram of the higher order of creation. This is really easy to understand when you consider how our father is infinite. And so he has been here from forever, uh, even past forever. And so how long has he had to create um, this creation? Um, how, how long has he had to build uh, this, um, these universes that he's building? Well, that's an infinite amount of time, as you can imagine. And so to think that we are the only universe starts to seem a little bit absurd, especially when you think that, you know, he will live forever. Our, our creator will live until eternity. But this universe will not. We can see um, how it's sometimes imploding on itself. And it's easy to understand how it's not going to last for forever. Well, we learned in this book that it is the dark matter that exists after this universe is destroyed that goes on to, to create the next universe or the next universe is depending on how far into the future you look. Verse 17 is talking about how we continue to try to limit him. It says that we uh, scandalize his name within our own laboratories of creation, basically trying to define who he is in our own terms. 
And we see a lot of this going on. That's why a lot of people want to reject this, these higher understandings. Um, they've basically grasped their own understandings, uh, you know, doing their own studies when they bother to turn off the TV for a minute and, and read some scripture. Um, they gain a little bit of insight, but then they think that all they know is all there is to know. So then when they hear um, these higher level understandings, um, just like anything else that they don't understand it tends to offend them and so they start to get a little bit scandalous and doing like it says there in verse 17 start analyzing and, and scrutinizing him based on their own limited understanding verse 18 says can this perceptual form of this planetary mind be so vain as to suppose that the universe does not exist beyond the scope of its own three-dimensional matter energy body so, like we said, we I guess I need to find another word, another phrase to say we're putting our father in a box around our three dimensional understanding. Some even paint him as a picture of us. You know, we, we, we assume that he looks like us. And so we paint our father in a portrait as if he's a humanoid and looks just like us. That's that's pretty vain. Verse 19 says, if the planetary mind cannot see the nature of God as the cosmos within the collective I am of its higher evolutionary body, how shall it determine its course through the heavens in order to behold and declare the true certain nature of life as recreated within the universe of living light? It goes on to say the universe which surrounds us is full of love powered emanations and love thresholds into which man as son of man will evolve as life begets life and eternal life so this here is talking about our universe and it says in verse 20 this shall be the communion of light which shall evolve into the eternal body of light known as the brotherhood of light and this is kind of another way of talking about um, who we've always known as angels. Like we said in the last class, this book is going to define um, a lot of these spirits or a lot of these entities in the spirit world, I should say. Um, whereas always we've called them angels. Well, we're going to get some definition on um, or some clarity on their specific roles, their specific tasks and who they are. And so we won't characterize them all as angels you know, going forward. Now, verse 21 is kind of rounding out that first key, key number one. And then you see uh, the second key is starting to be talked about here in verse 22. It says the second key is saying that the creative mind exists not only as Lord Adonai, but as King, Melech, and as Redeemer, Messiah. This means that the mind itself does not have to become incarnate in order to act as king or redeemer so now this is a really important concept to understand here um as we read along in this book how it says this means that the mind itself does not have to become incarnate in order to act as king or redeemer this is talking about our father who is at the center of the universe he does not have to put on a physical body himself in order to come down here we think on the story of the of the messiah there's you know a lot of argument those in the know will say that the messiah and the father are one they are the same and then others who will point out and say well who was he praying to then when he was on the cross saying you know why have i forsaken thee when you understand this right here in this verse it makes sense even though the father and the messiah were one you still had the mind at the center of the universe it never had to leave if that makes sense uh verse 23 may help us out it says the mind can stay where it is and program the redeemer messiah into any teacher of light and so this is this is what our father does he doesn't leave that that place of which we can think of him as being the center of these universes he doesn't have to materialize himself into this particular universe leaving the other universes behind as he put himself into a body here it says that he can program any being into this teacher of light so he can take any person so when you think about the messiah and how he, it was after he got baptized did the spirit descend on upon him like a dove well this is what it's talking about here 
he could do that from where he's at. And you can see there in verse 23, some of the other beings uh, that this happened to. But then look at verse 24. It says, the mind can stay where it is and program the Lord, Adonai, into many universes, into many galaxies, into many life stations. So when we come back up and we look at the key, it says the creative mind as the center of this universe is known as Lord, King and Redeemer. Well, he's at the center, but he's programming these beings here on Earth, similar to the way the Ophanim are programming the prophets. You know, they're, they're speaking through the prophets. Verse 25 speaks on these Ophanim. It says King Melech is sovereign over all powers, principles, and galactic universes of the Ophanim, the Benai Elohim, and the Heos Har Kodesh that are beyond our level of intelligence. So now in this book, it's important to uh, get the definitions of these words. So let's go over and let's see if we can find what this Benai Elohim is referring to. Okay, so we're looking over here at the glossary. It says the Benai Elohim, the sons of the creator gods who dispatch judgment and hierarchical education in the absence of power in the lower heavens. These paradise sons work with the derivative systems of creation. They choose the selected seed, which is transplanted from the imperfect creation to levels of the divine invisible. And it's referenced in Job chapter 38, verse 7. So these here are talking about the Ophanim here, like we spoke about. Um, we, we hear about the Ophanim as being the, um, the spirit behind the prophets, those who teach the prophets. Um, they were actually, the prophets were actually talking to these Ophanim. Now let's look up this other word, um, Heos Ha Kodesh. Uh, it says the highest servants of the ancient of days. These lords serve the father's infinite plan of creation by working with his trinitized form of appearance. They are a non evolving hierarchy. So like we said in this book, we're going to get definitions of the angels. They're going to we've always called these beings angels. But here we're going to learn specifically some of their roles and you know who they are and the differences between each and each so let's just go on like you see there in verse 26 it says the higher orders of intelligence understand that the messiah is where the redemptive energies of the body of light are manifested so this is the higher order of intelligences and you know this is really important to understand as we go through this book is that these this is what we're learning is of a higher order of intelligence. So for those who want to keep themselves um, on the milk diet, you know, maybe, you know, only reading Psalms 23 or whatever, they're going to have a hard time understanding these, these, these higher levels of understanding. But the thing is, guys, we're living in the time in which we were promised that knowledge would increase. So if you have individuals that want to stay as milk babies, then it's, to me, it doesn't seem really fair that they, you know, want to hold everybody else back. You know, it's like, you know, they settled in with a third grade education and offended by anybody who wants to go to graduate school. Well, that that's not really fair. Um, and it's kind of dangerous if you think the time that we're living in and how the Illuminati is trying to keep everybody ignorant of these things so that they can have their way with them. So that's why the um, Third Testament says that those who would interfere with this higher level of intelligences are actually in servants of darkness. They're actually serving darkness. They, they may not be dark beings themselves, but they're actually doing the work of them. So let's go on. Verse 27 says, when they are manifested within you, you are a part of the collective Messiah. So you have these entities that are working with us anyway, but you also have people that are trying to block them out. And one of the ways, one of the most effective ways for them to block out our access to these higher intelligences is for us to forsake the law. When we start to abandon the law and get away from the Torah, 
um, that actually puts us in an unclean state where we have no access to these brothers of light. And the Illuminati, that's their plan, is to keep us away from these brothers of light so these entities of dark can have their way with us. So that's why it's important when we hear people trying to shut down this knowledge. Is, you know, we're going to have to find some way to shut them down instead. You know, we're going to have to, you know, quieten them up while they trying to shut us up. Somehow we're going to have to quieten them up, even if it's just only pushing that button to ignore that particular person because they're, they're quite destructive uh, in, in this late in the game. Uh, verse 27 goes on to say the collective Messiah unifies not only the 144,000 ascended masters that this physical universe is familiar with, but all physical universes that interpenetrate this physical plane and those beyond all other frequencies of light. So the, these are the entities behind the 144,000, these Ophanim, these B'nai Elohim, the Hayos HaKadosh. And so this is why it's important not to get caught up in these words. It's so bad when, you know, some of these people get caught up in these words. Given two examples, one was um, the pastor of my local church. When I gave her the Third Testament of the Bible, she could not make it past the first chapter of the Third Testament because of the word era, the three letter word E-R-A, era, which means times. She did not recognize that word. And so she essentially gave the book back, claiming that she didn't know what an era was. And so to her, the book was meaningless because she didn't understand that three letter word. And then another example, I had a minister from Colorado somewhere who heard me say the word Abba in a in a video and he called and blessed me out. Um, how could I use this word Abba even using profanity as he, you know, how dare you use this word Abba and not realizing that this word Abba is actually in the New Testament as well as the Old Testament. And so he 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 actually embarrassed himself really, really bad simply because he was unfamiliar with the word Abba. So when we hear these words and hear people speak on these words, we really need to be cautious because they don't know what they're talking about and we obviously don't know what we're talking about because we haven't studied on these words but the thing about it we have to realize where knowledge comes from uh satan is not even a real character guys he's, he's not really real it's not really a dude walking around creating all this havoc this stuff is actually being created from ourself so if this is a entity within us that's causing us to do error how can we attribute knowledge to him or wisdom to him or say that he's created something Thing or, or, or anything like that. No, we have to go back to the book of Proverbs and understand that all knowledge comes from our father. All wisdom comes from our father. It is just those people who are trying to trick us up that are using these words that we're unfamiliar with in order to do just that, to trick us up. But let's go on. Right there in verse 28, it says that it's important that we understand that our God is not of this three dimension. He's not uh, limited to this universe. And then it has this word Adam Cadman in here. Let's look this one up. Only because we see this word used so many times. Um, it says the Adam Cadman, it says the light manifestation of paradise sons and lords of light who have evolved or been created beyond a body form as man knows it. The light body that has the ability to take on any form necessary to create and teach all manner of thinking creation, including superspecie creation, which exists as energy entities. The Adam Cad man is bestowed upon the light body, which becomes an extension of Yahweh. So hopefully you got more out of that definition than I did. Um, looking down here and it says Adamic man, it says the exclusive manifestation of the Adam Cad man as a spiritual physical creation. So it's like this Adam Cad man is, is behind um, who we are or something like that. Like I said, if you if you understand this, um, please put it down in the comment section. We see this term so many times in here. I think we're going to have to understand what this is, even though I'm having a bit of a hard time with it right now. I'm probably just overthinking it, so let's go on. Here's another term we can look up though. Ahaya Asha Ahaya. Well, it's defined it there. It says that I am that I am, 
or the I shall be what I shall be, a constant evolving, a constant remaking of every order of creation. So you can see already that, you know, we're going to get into some higher understandings here. Shame on those who would actually try to prevent us from understanding this. You know, it's, it kind of reminds me of school where those who don't want to go on any higher try to prevent those who would. It says, if we are to participate in the ongoing biocosmic evolution of continuity and change within the creative continuum of the higher evolution, we must release ourselves from all vain endeavors in order to quicken the establishment of Yahweh is here. In other words, we have to stop putting them in a box. He says, this shall be the great and awe-inspiring Sabaoth of Adonai Tisbeoth, the Lord of armies. In verse 33, is saying, um, it is the creative fulfillment of our destiny. It is why we have been endowed with our many bodies of relativity. And it is why there is a fulfillment of prophecy within our day. We'll finish up with verse 34. It says the fulfillment comes in the visitation and appearance of Merkaba and in the invitation now being extended to our higher bodies of light synthesis to join in the communion of light set in honor of the lords of light who are to be heard and understood as the lords Metatron, Makedozodek, and Maitreya. This is the feast of lights. This is the brotherhood of eternal light. So you can imagine there's a, a lot going on here and it, it Shame to say, but it's kind of like those that are lazy and don't want to spend their time trying to understand this, that are trying to convince the rest of us that we shouldn't. Thing about it, we're all going to have this Merkaba event. Let's look that up as the last thing we'll do, because there's plenty of people who are actually seeing this now. The glossary says the Merkaba is divine light vehicle used by the masters to probe and reach the faithful in the many dimensions of the divine mind. So, like I said, there are people who are seeing this, but it is what they're seeing is the light. These beings, these vehicles, so to speak, are light vehicles, meaning that they're all, that's all that's to them is light. Um, that's why when people try to zoom in and actually see what's there behind the light, there's nothing behind the light. This is a light vehicle. Um, but the thing is, you know, man, like I said, he wants to convince us or wants to keep us ignorant. So he's trying to convince us that these are alien spaceships or something like that and trying to make us fearful of these. These are actually what's described over in Ezekiel chapter one. Uh, these is the wheels within the wheels. It says the Merkaba can take on many forms of a brilliant briolet in the physical worlds. So. What these people are seeing um, is these Merkabas, uh, these light vehicles. So this is important why we have to educate ourselves and get into the know. And uh, in all of the scripture, guys, that I've read, at least, and I believe I've read a large bit of it. Um, this is the only book that describes what this Merkaba is. And this is, again, this is why they want to keep this book from us. This is why they want to keep this knowledge from us so that they can claim that they're aliens. You know, they can say that they're aliens and that, you know, we should be scared of them. And the only way they can do so is if they keep us ignorant as to what they actually are. And so we'll cover more on it in the next uh, video in this series. So make sure you subscribe so you can see when them videos come out. Go ahead and hit the like button and please leave a comment. Help me out, guys, with some of this stuff. I'm having trouble with it, as you can see. But, you know, we can all work together. Um, compare our knowledge maybe we can get some understanding of all of this so i'll see you in the comment section